of Florida and um, has dived most of the cave systems uh, here. He's been instrumental in my cave training as he was my intro to cave and cavern instructor and has also been my trimix instructor where he insisted that I be full cave before I start training. So he's a pretty conscientious instructor and uh, pretty good uh, to tell us more about cave diving. Over to, to you, Michael. I'm sorry, what was the question? <laughs> it was, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Yeah, well, like you said, you know, I was born in Czech Republic. I moved to the United States in 1998. I was already a professional diver, a dive master at that time. Uh, in uh, 2000, I uh, became an instructor, open water instructor. And the same year, I uh, got hooked on cave diving. I took a cavern course from one of the local cave diving instructors. And I got immediately hooked. So I was uh, continuing diving. And two years later, I became a full cave diver and became a passion. And after another four years, I was uh, able to finish. Uh, now we gave one uh, level instructor course. Uh, with scooter sellers uh, <clears throat> and um, then it took a while that um, you know life carries on and uh, a few things change but I was still actively diving not teaching as much up till to 2012 when uh, Ed Sorensen uh, I'm sure everybody knows who he is uh, uh, we became friends because he opened a dive shop at the Mariana Mill Pond area where um, uh, the closest big cave systems are. And he asked me to help him to teach the classes. So I became a, a, a full cave and specialty cave instructor, like stage cave, DTV cave instructor under under him. And been working- Hey, Michael, you need to speak a little bit louder. Okay, I think the microphone's a little too far. It's probably this one. Okay. Uh, yeah, much better. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, <laughs> uh, so. Since then, I was um, I've been working with him, uh, teaching classes uh, and uh, preparing people, you know, for uh, the future adventures. Um, the cave diving history it's so complicated and so complex that you know we don't have a time to. Uh, cover everything. I'm just, you know, want to tell you that uh, cave diving, it's uh, one of the uh, 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 styles of technical diving uh, and it's focused on, you know, overhead environment uh, in the caves around the world. Uh, obviously, if uh, you go online and you check, you know, the hotspots for cave diving, Florida is one of them. North Florida, Northwest Florida is one of them. That's why we have so big concentration of divers, cave divers in this area, including instructors as well. Uh, the cave diving itself, it's not an old uh, sport, I would say, uh, because it became uh, very popular, not that far ago, you know, late 70s, uh, uh, early 80s, there was a call the, the golden era of cave diving that all the big names you probably heard before were uh, exploring the cave systems like uh, Lamar Hires, Woody Jesper, Bill Rineker, uh, <clears throat> and so on, Tom Mount, and so on, uh, you know, I can go on. And um, so, uh, and it's kind of uh, interesting that we still have that uh, the gold era generation uh, divers and cave diving instructors still living, both of them. And uh, we are, I would say, the third generation of cave divers, cave diving instructors kind of following on the footsteps and uh, um, bringing the uh, exploration to another level. <clears throat> Obviously, that's associated with the uh, 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 development of technology and, um, you know, available resources that we have today that they didn't have 30 years ago or 40 years ago. 
So, um, and uh, I guess, you know, uh, that's pretty much what I can say as the introduction. And now I guess uh, I'm just gonna have to answer the questions if there are any. Yeah, I sent you six questions yesterday. You wanna go one by one over them so that- uh... Yes, I've, I've read them down. <laughs> Uh, the first one was, uh, what are you going to do if you uh, uh getting stuck or not getting stuck in a cave? Uh, interesting question. Uh, actually, here, what do, you, what do you do if you get stuck going through a uh, crevice? Well, getting stuck uh, in the cave, uh, that could be a problem, obviously. And there are known cases, unfortunately, that... Um, Cave divers didn't make it because they get stuck. Um, so uh, what do you do? Well, first, the, the major thing is you, you prevent, you know, being stuck. You try not to do it. You try to stay <clears throat> in a passage where you can pass through in your configuration. If you're diving back mount or side mount, it doesn't matter. You can get stuck in both, obviously. So, uh, and that's the point for the whole cave diving and cave diving uh, training, actually you try to avoid, uh, prevent the problem. Uh, that's the best way to do it. Once you get stuck, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a complicated. Some people say, well, if you're getting into the cave, you just back out. Well, it's not as easy as it sounds because uh, sometimes if you don't see behind yourself, uh, where you going, what you're doing, what's the equipment doing behind you, it's really hard to manipulate it and it's really hard, you know, to find out the right passage. So I would say what you do, uh, first thing, try to avoid. Second, um, when you moving through the cave, uh, what you should do and always do, you kind of, you know, scan the way ahead of you with your light and see, okay, well, the passage looks like this and this is the passage where I can swim through with the gear configuration that I have with no problem. And if there's a restriction that I need to go through, uh, is it doable in this gear configuration that you were? Uh, some caves, you know, require that you have to remove your gear. Uh, some restrictions require, you know, you take your bottle off from your side mount rig and you push the bottle in front of you to move through. Some require that you actually switch to no mount configuration and so on. So it really depends on the, on the circumstances and on that particular passage. But uh, the big thing is, you know, try to avoid. Now, uh, if um, you go kind of in a depth to it, uh, majority of the exploration divers and exploration diving today, it's drawn through small places where the previous generation using the back mount configuration could not pass through. So um, that type of diving today is done pretty much solo uh, because if you get stuck and you need to move and you need to remove some gear and then you need to turn around and there is somebody stuck behind you, uh, that could be a bad day. So again, you know, there's no general answer for it, what you do uh, when you get stuck, but um, you can prevent it and um, use your common sense. Okay, if this is really too narrow for me to pass through with big double tanks on my back and, and a, a stage bottles, you know, it's probably not a good idea to move uh, through that section, uh, go another way or, you know, uh, change the gear configuration. So, um, and. The gear configuration should be a tool, um, not the religion, I would say. So um, I guess, did I answer the question? I guess that was pretty much. Okay. <laughs> Especially the part about the gear being a tool and not just religion, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, you, you, and, you, you and me, I know, we both know, you know, that uh, I can do back mount, double dive, and I can do side mount, you know, I don't really care. If it works, it works. Uh, and I'm not gonna, you know, uh, be bashing people using uh, this type of gear, you know, because it's not cool anymore. Or, you know, <laughs> it's a tool, right? It's a yeah. tool, you know. And I still do back mount diving. You know, I prefer side mount in the caves, which that's one of the questions uh, on on the bottom that I will go to. Uh, for uh, I prefer back mount diving for the uh, deep sea diving or open water diving because it's uh, it's easier to set it up and. Uh, 
logistically prepared, you know, for the trip than side mount. So either way, okay. So um, what do you do if you get claustrophobic while diving through low ceiling caves? <laughs> That's a good one. I don't get claustrophobic for some reason. Uh, I never been claustrophobic. And on the other hand, if you think about, and we talk about this in the, in your cave class, uh, if there is an emergency and uh, the worst case scenario is that uh, you lost the line, you don't know which way is out, which way is into the cave. In a big cave, it takes a long time to find the line, right? Because it's a huge space and you don't see, there's no visibility. In a smaller cave, I'm not saying it's easy, but it's easier because you have a limited space that you can look for the line. So uh, I never get claustrophobic. Uh, so if, I mean, if you get uh, uh, stressed, I would say stress, it's a, let's say it's a long penetration dive and uh, you um, are 10,000 feet from the exit, obviously that will affect your thinking and the comfort level. I would just say, you know, stop, breathe, get your breath, you know, check your gas supply, make sure you plan this accordingly. So if something go wrong, you have plenty of gas to get out of the cave and move on, you know, and if it's not comfortable anymore, just call the dive, right? You can call the dive, um, you know, anytime for any reason, this is one of them. But um, yeah, I never was claustrophobic. So I hope I never will. Okay. Did that answer the question? I mean, just to add to that, I mean, if yeah, I mean, just to add to that, if you're claustrophobic, you shouldn't be wanting to go into caves. I mean, it's it's a complete, uh, you yeah. know, uh, yeah. uh, why would you want to put yourself in something, you know, like sit into a dark box when you actually know you have claustrophobia? So, yes, if you don't, yes. if you have an issue, have you know, going into elevator, yeah. uh, you probably shouldn't be cave diving. Exactly. That's true. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, so uh, another question was, when you surface in cave, how does it affect your deco time? And uh, yeah, well, uh, it's not only just, you know, when you surface, uh, there is not as many caves in Florida that you have uh, dry sections that, you know, you go in and it's called uh, do the sump diving, you know, I'm talking about uh, the Northwest Florida, obviously, you know, Tennessee and, and and, and Arkansas and, and you know text of the different type of caves in Europe uh, but I know what you mean um, what uh, the problem generally is <clears throat> if you go back to your training and we do some uh, deco planning you know we always did the square profile so you start to go to the bottom spend some time on the bottom and then you slowly deco it all the way back well obviously you know that in a cave it's not always possible because the cave might start shallow, go deep, and then slowly go in shallow again and go deep, deep, deep again. Not going too far, we have that in a Jackson Blue cave or a hole in the wall, where, uh, you know, in that uh, stratosphere section, it's 20 feet deep. But the majority of the cave, it's around 80, 85. So what happened is still moving into the cave, you starting, you know, a little bit of then you go deep to 100 feet and slowly progressing to shallow, and then you have to go the same way back. Uh, and that will affect the, the, the deco profile. Uh, and that's when uh, I think the technology took over and it makes it so, uh, so much easier because now uh, with the computers that we're using, and backup computers that we also using, it's very easy to plan the dive and follow the uh, findings of the computer or the numbers that they giving you while you dive in. Uh, I'm not saying it's not doable to do it on the tables or do the calculations. It's just going to be a long day. And um, the main thing is you have to have enough gas, obviously. So you plan accordingly know reserves uh, but other than that um, what you should try to avoid is the rapid ascents even if you're still in a cave and that is the site uh, the, the sump or the dry section you try to get into you need to be careful watch your computers or bottom gauges or timers or whatever you're using you know to follow the deco profile obviously going up rapidly can uh, produce the bubbles in a system and that will later be in 
problem. Um, there's a, one more thing that I was thinking about it when you made me those questions yesterday. And um, that's something that the old cave divers taught me when I was taking my full cave class after the dive and the dive was over. And it was not an even, you know, hardcore dive, not a long deco, but it was lots of up and downs. And the last deco stop uh, was maybe two, uh, three minutes each, 20 feet, 15 feet. But uh, the last one they always did and all of them did was at the surface for 10 minutes. They just get out and they do nothing. They maybe remove the deco bottle, but they just sit in the water just to off gas for 10 minutes because uh, A, they didn't have the sophisticated you know, electronics that we have today. And B, that profile that we just talked about, you know, going up and down, up and down. You don't really know. We don't really know exactly what's going on unless you would have a physician on the side taking a blood sample or urine, you know, and bubble testing and tell you exactly what was going on. Uh, but the problem is, you know, that being constantly, you know, compressed and then recompressed and compressed and recompressed, don't really know. Uh, majority of the population will probably go unaffected. But I've seen a divers getting bent on relatively, you know, um, shallow dives, but lots of up and downs. And buddy of mine got uh, skin bends uh, doing the type of diving like this. So uh, he adjusted his diving profile and he's doing a lot more um, deco stops or safety stops, whatever you want to call it, off gassing stops uh, to, you know, offset this effect. So, um, did that answer the question? Yeah, I mean, pretty much. And, and one of the reasons why this came up was because of an open, uh, open water swim through and then uh, exit through a chimney, which some people were doing. And they asked me this question and I was like, yeah, exactly what you said. You, know, you would go slowly if you had to do it rather than anything else. And coming back to those 10 minutes of uh, you know, uh, sitting outside, this reminds me exactly of my full cave class with Ed and you you know, sitting and doing the debriefs when I'm shivering <laughs> yeah. in the water after the dive. I mean, easy way to, you know, uh, just... Yeah, so good thermal protection, it's the most <laughs> uh, because of these long, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. absolutely. But, uh, and that's another another thing that could affect, obviously, that's not only related to this profile, right. but, you know, uh, decompression dive, generally speaking, you know, the thermal comfort. Uh, it's also and, and you know what's going on with Steve Bogart, right, uh, about his uh, getting bent at shallow depths and relatively easy dives and how he's yes, quit after yes. years of diving, you know. Okay, yes, so... I think you sent me that reading. I read it right. on his uh, Facebook page. And, you know, I, I'm not a physician, you know, I'm, you know, amateur diver, you know, enthusiast, you know, I, I read about decompression and, you know, it's a hobby for me and, and passion. But, you know, what he wrote on his uh, Facebook, it sounds to me like um, it might be the, uh, the years of accumulated, you know, uh, bubble stress uh, that, you know, and he was a big diver. I mean, he did dives, you know, long dives, big dives, deep dives, shallow dives, you know, he did, he did it all. So it might be part of this um, prolonged, you know, uh, damage from the bubbles yeah. that now the immune system is just yeah, broken down. It just can't take it anymore, which is kind of sad and scary. So general recommendations for all the divers, cave divers, you know, when dives is over, the last stops always on the surface, 10 minutes, do nothing. Try to relax, you know, off gas, let the body recover and um, <laughs> hope for the best that, you know, we're not going to get affected uh, or, you know, cut yeah. short of diving by. Okay. Yep. Okay. For cave, I'm curious how do you how do you enter and exit caves with very narrow entry? Um, very narrow entry. Again, you know, uh, realistically speaking, uh, if you are newly certified cave diver, you are probably not gonna be doing any exploration diving anytime soon. So uh, going into the cave. Uh, with the instructor or somebody has been there, they will tell you, okay, well, this is the entrance. It's about 10 feet long, that high, you just squeeze through it and it opens up. So you just follow them. It's easy. Um, if you, however, entering the cave that you've never been into, and there's a narrow entrance, 
Um, I learned that from my buddy, Jason Richards, who is, uh, he's a great exploration diver and, and a cartographer. And um, what they do, they take the fins off and they go feet first. So if there is an entrance that they've never been into and they just poke the head inside and they don't really see, you know, what if I can pass through or not, they minimize the gear. So small tanks, you know, um, maybe no mount tanks. And they just go feet first uh, to see if, you know, they can uh, manage to move through the restriction or the entrance or exit. And um, of course, you know, running the line. Because uh, the reasoning behind that, you know, if you're getting in, you get stuck, you have to back up and it's very difficult, you know, it's not easy as it looks like. And um, so what do you do if you, I get stuck, you know, now I just, you know, try to squeeze out and I see where I'm going, I'm getting out of the cave. Uh, there's a one more great video about this particular problem and that's from uh, uh, Ivo Kalushev. He's a Bulgarian uh, cave diver living in Mexico full time. And uh, he posted a great video a couple of years ago about a section of the cave that they were mapping. And it was, uh, it was a big dive. It was way too into the cave. And that was a big, big, the big uh, small restriction to the lower passage. And that's exactly what he did. He just removed the gear. He just put the one bottle in front of him and feet first he went into. And that's where the film ends, okay? The movie ends. So I emailed him later. I said, hey, you know, how is it going? And he said, well, it's, a, it's, another, it's another world. It's a big, huge cave system. But this one restriction, we had to negotiate it this way before we find out, you know, we can do it uh, head first and, you know, what we're going to do. Um, so uh, that, was, uh, that was something that um, I learned from those guys. Um, be honest with you, I have not done it by myself. Uh, uh, my exploration is very limited. I did only few passages that I thought nobody was before, and they were fairly not big, but not small. Uh, for some and... reason, we seem to have lost you, Michael. Sorry, what? I said for some reason, we lost you in between. Yeah, better now. Oh. So what did you hear the last thing? <laughs> we heard you talk about uh, Ivan and his uh, exploration in Mexico, and then you were talking about uh, uh, your uh, uh, exploration uh, experience. Yeah, well, like I said, you know, he, uh, uh, those guys uh, develop, uh, not uh, develop, they show me the way how they move through the narrow entrance, feet first, you know, removing the gear. And again, the reason is if you get stuck, you just, you know, go, out and you see where you're going and you're actually moving out of the cave. Okay. Okay. Sorry, I'm just gonna do one more thing here. Is Okay, I think we have some kind of technical difficulty which we're stuck. Uh, Michael, can you hear us? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, good. So we want to go ahead and continue with the next questions. You okay. want to take the... Is there any specific marine life? I'm only in caves. Are there any steps we should be taking when encounter caves such like this? Like Yes, there are, um, and I'm not an expert on all of them. I can tell you what we have here in North Florida, Northwest Florida, and uh, the one, the most famous one uh, in the caves that we are diving to, it's the uh, it's the Georgia blind salamander. Uh, it's a it's an endemic species, only living in the southeast uh, United States. Uh, Florida, Georgia, maybe Alabama, and uh, it's a it's a unique uh, uh, animal, completely blind. And uh, now there's a colony living in San Diego, uh, which uh, they were collecting scientific experiment, collecting data. Excuse me. Four years ago, something like that. And they established a successful colony 
of the salamander in San Diego Zoo or the the, uh, the uh, uh, institute over there. I'm not really sure who they really were. Uh, so that's one of them. And we also have the albino crawfish. Uh, they call it um, Santa Fe. It's one of them that lives close to the Santa Fe, Aaron uh, Santa Fe River in uh, uh, East Florida. Uh, but we do have them also in uh, caves that we dive here in Mill Pond, Mariana. <clears throat> And Peacock Springs, and uh, you know the caves uh, more down to east and central Florida. Uh, any precautions? Well, yeah, do not try to disturb them. Uh, our presence in a cave it's disturbing enough. So if you try to chase them or uh, collect them or whatever, you know it's it's stressful for the animal as well. Other than that, I don't think they really suffer from any contamination from the, the gas. Uh, uh, they more threatened by, at least per the official uh, release, they more threatened by a loss of habitat uh, when the caves are getting uh, uh, destroyed or uh, over, the, the, you know, the water's, you know, pumped out too fast. Uh, or it's polluted by uh, fertilizers from nearby farms. So stuff like that. Us as a divers, uh, it's not a big of a threat if you're not trying you know, to catch them, I guess, physically harass them. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, that's two of those that I know. Obviously there's some type of fish that you will never see in the open water. Uh, there's a, the, a, a, the catfish that uh, it's causing issues in one of the caves that are actually feeding on the salamanders. They learn how to follow the divers into the cave, following the light and, you know, hunting for the salamanders or the, the crawfish. Uh, and certain type of small fishes that they live in the caves, uh, nothing significant. I don't think any of them was uh, listed as an endangered or vulnerable species. But the salamander and the crawfish are listed as a vulnerable, vulnerable, yeah, vulnerable species. And um, those are the two that I know about uh, the place that I'm diving to. Okay. And last question. Can you still hear me? Yeah, we can still hear you. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And uh, the last question that Wish emailed me, it's cave diving with open circuit breathing apparatus back for the caving system. Uh, that is something to think about. You know, honestly, the rebreather uh, machine has been on the market longer than the open circuit, but because of the complexity and the, the, uh, and the, and the, the, the cost, uh, the divers were not really that big on to using it, except military, obviously, divers. Uh, so the rebreather is becoming very popular the last 10 years, especially in the area that I live and I dive. And before it was all open circuit, even the big uh, dives done by Sheck Exley, that he solo dive to 10,000 feet in the Cathedral Canyon, it was done on the open circuit. <clears throat> if any of the damage uh, been done to the caves uh, the last 30 years, uh, it's not been measured. And I'm talking about the bubbles being exhausted into the cave. What is visible, however, is the physical damage done by divers to the cave, you know, uh, hitting the ceiling with the tanks or uh, grabbing on stuff that, you know, break away. <clears throat> um, there are certain caves in the Florida, they are limited only to scientific research. And I do remember one of the researchers were taking a class with, uh, with the dive shop that I worked for, uh, specifically for diving this particular uh, spring. 
uh, she was a PhD candidate and she was taking a class to be on a closed circuit rebreather because uh, it was limited to um, closed circuit uh, apparatus in the system, not to disturb or introduce any other uh, chemicals or gas, if you wish, to the ecosystem. So that's what she was doing. Other than that, if it's uh, if it's bad or good, you know, uh, I would say uh, just thinking about it this way, the last impact you introduce in the system, so you're not touching anything and you're not uh, exhausting any gas in the system, uh, then better. Is it harmful when you swim through with the uh, open circuit? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, but I think the CCR is the better way. Uh, the CCR, closed circuit, uh, <clears throat> what I think it gives you extra uh, safety feature. And that's the only reason I actually switched to the closed circuit uh, technology was uh, the extra uh, time that you have if the rebreather is working properly, obviously. If there is an issue, you have a lot more time to solve the problem on the open circuit, you know, with every breath, you have a last time. So uh, generally speaking on the question, you know, if it's better or bad, um, no, uh, we've been diving the caves, or the uh, cave divers have been diving the caves since uh, late 50s. Uh, there's some visible damage in more of the popular caves that you will see. Uh, I'm talking about the Genie Springs, Peacock, Jackson Blue. Uh, that's caused by the traffic. Uh, maybe it would be a good idea to do some research or some observations on the passages where the divers you know, moving through, exhausting the bubbles, what they do to the ceiling. Okay. Other than that, um, like I said, you know, a few areas, it's uh, only limited to closed circuit. Those are very protected by the state and the federal government uh, areas uh, with some unique features, unique uh, endemic life. They will not allow you to go there on the open circuit. So uh, I guess that's pretty much it. Okay, uh, cool. which, can you still hear me? Yes, I can. So there are some more questions which they've put out. Uh, one is, uh, can you connect like a John line to the main line where there is a chance of silt out before proceeding forward? I'm going to leave that to you to answer. Uh, there's, a, there's a one. Yeah, it is, it is possible sometimes. It's, um, uh, the problem with the line is it's not a nice and straight shoot line, you know, through exactly. the tunnel. The lines, it zigs sometimes, you know, it's going into a, a passage where you cannot uh, physically follow a cold line trap. It's there, but you know you have to negotiate it, obviously. And also, there are tie-offs and placements. So at every tie-off or placement, you would have to physically remove the line and reclip it. I, I know what he means. I mean, it's like a, doing the a climbing. Okay, right. You have the safety line. There's a rope, you know, on the on the wall. You tie yourself to it. Yeah. Uh, uh, theoretically, it's possible. Uh, practically, you're going to have another line that, you know, is going to be dangling somewhere between you and the gold line. And every tie off, every placement, you would have to go physically unclip it and reclip it. Pretty much. Is it doable? Yes. Uh, in main passage where we have the gold line or the, the, the thick parachute cold line or permanent line, what you want to call it, it's possible. In a small passage or offshoots, where is the exploration line laid? It's a thin line that you don't really want to disturb that much, you know, uh, because you don't know how long it's been there. Some of them were there for a very long time. <laughs> it's like, uh, you know, uh, Jackson yeah. Blue. Uh, yeah. You've seen those. Some of them are still like, you know, twisted lines, not even, you know, braided. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to do anything with that line. You'd be like, <laughs> Please, you know, stay intact. Okay. So uh, putting a, a, a Caribbean clip or something over the line is probably not a good idea, especially every 15 feet, you have a, a intersection, which is called T or Y. So you have another line connecting to the line that you're trying to stay on. So it will be a logistical nightmare or, you know, you're constantly reclipping yourself. Uh, so it, uh, I never seen it done in the cave, but I understand what he or, or she meant. 
and, and might be doable on the, in the Big Passage or Mainline in the Jackson Blue or, or Peacock, and it will be doable. Uh, he or she will look quite of unique. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Okay, next question. Uh, what kind of certifications do you need to cave dive? Are there any recommended certifications that would help as well? Okay, so uh, based on the standards, uh, the standards are close to each other from the certifying agencies. You should be at least advanced diver uh, with at least 50 log dives and nitrox. Nitrox helps uh, because some of the caves are in a average depth close to 80 feet. So on the air, you will accumulate the deco pretty quick and up to the full cave certification level, there is no decompression allowed. So we both, we all dive nitrox, you know, to cut out the nitrogen and have more bottom time. So advanced nitrox will definitely help. And what really will help is if you have some uh, fundamental courses like uh, uh, Intro to Tech, uh, GUI Fundamentals is a great course, uh, the ABCs, Advanced Buoyancy Control Techniques from PSAI, any of these uh, fundamental courses, they teach you how to adjust the gear properly, how to move in the water properly, how to do proper the frog kick, the helicopter spin, the backward kick, you know, how to do the gear share drills. That will help tremendously. Why? Because in the, in the overhead environment, you know, starting with the cavern course, we're going to start teaching you how to use the line, how to use the primary line, what's the protocol, how you enter and exit the cave. And then in intro cave, you know, we actually go really beyond the daylight zone, adding more distance and the apprentice and fool all came together. And in these courses, you cannot think about, oh, do I know how to hover? Do I know how to do the frog kick? Do I know how to backward kick if there's, you know, some issue? So these courses will tremendously help to move you through these overhead environment courses easily. Right. Next uh, is, uh, I mean, you've already covered what, what are the things to watch out for when cave diving. You've already covered that. But do you want to go ahead specifically? What are the things to watch out for when cave diving? Yeah, well, I always try. Uh, yeah, of course, just, you know, uh, recap. Uh, try to prevent the accident or prevent any issues because the courses that, that, that will teach you how to deal with the issue it's the best we can, not we, but the designers of the courses came, came up with. It doesn't mean that, you know, if there is a problem and you lost a lot and you're running low, low on gas and you have to share gas with your teammate, that you're going to make it. We can teach you what to do and, you know, do your best and hopefully, you know, you find a line and you'll be able to move out. It's not, you know, 100% guarantee. It's like a tech diving, you know, decompression diving, same thing. We teach you how to do or what to do uh, to make it less less uh, risky, but it's not a hundred percent guarantee. So I always try to prevent uh, anything that could go wrong. I always try to keep keep good buoyancy, not kicking silt out. I always monitor my gas supplies. You know, I always do the plan, and uh, uh, I'm a little bit paranoid about a gas, so I always have more than I need. Because like Ed says, you know, it's uh, better to have it, not need it, than need it and not have it. Okay. Right. So even on my closed circuit diving, uh, um, that you doing your bailout, you know, uh, calculations, I always treat every dive like a solo dive. So I always have enough gas, you know, to get myself out. I'm not relying on anybody else. Uh, if it's two of us, there's an extra, you know, a safety in his gas supply, obviously, but I always treat it like a solo dive and that if some things go wrong, I have to have enough gas to get out on my own. <clears throat> and, you know, uh, uh, what we teach in the apprentice and full cave course is the cave, cave awareness. And that's what I just said, you know, once you're swimming, you're kind of scanning, you know, what the cave looks like, what could be an issue swimming out. Uh, is there a uh, restriction? Is the restriction passable? Is it dirty restriction? Is it clean restriction? What's going to happen when I turn around swimming out? What's going to happen if I have to share gas with my uh, co-diver? You know, is there an issue? Is there a line trap? So stuff like that. And it's like, you know, uh, 
swimming through and, and taking a mental notes. Okay, well, this passage, it's nice and clean. There's no silt on the bottom. And it's a long stretch, long tunnel. Nothing really can go wrong here. So we shouldn't really have any issues. Well, this passage, however, it's kind of narrow. So stuff like that, you know, mm -hmm. kind of uh, do a mental notes, what could go wrong and be prepared if something go wrong, what do you have to do to deal with it? Right. I mean, like, like what, when we did the course, I mean, it was simple, right? You have to be line aware, light aware, and, you know, uh, then just look around and sight see. So just, you need to know where it is, where it's, it, is it going into a trap or is there a tie off somewhere which you might miss, you know? So uh, like you just said, you know, it's completely risk management. Everything is all yeah. about risk management. Absolutely. Okay. So we have one more question which says, are the lions changed over times in caves as they get old and may break easily? And then follow up question is when I did my cavern course, the goal line was completely covered in marine life. Wouldn't it pose a threat of cutting hands when exiting the cave in a blackout situation? Okay, so question number one. Yes, the lines are replaced. However, not in the, the small or the off passages. The off passages are usually, okay, not always. Usually, you know, the original lines laid there by the original explorer, uh, which we do have a lot uh, like in the Jackson Blue. Uh, so the line, the gold line has been replaced in the main passage a couple of times already. And I'm speaking about the most popular cave systems, the, the, the main passages, the gold line, it's maintained by a, a, a line committee from a nonprofit organizations like uh, NSS CDS and uh, North Florida Spring Alliance. Uh, so they do uh, some repairs and replacements. Uh, the small passages or side passages, that's a little bit more complicated unless there is somebody uh, enthusiast enough to do it, uh, then majority of them are not. And like I said, I've seen, I've seen a line that's been there for over 30 years, all twisted lines. So <laughs> yeah, that, that keeps you thinking, you know, what if something go wrong? So, um, and, and it's, it's a hard work, you know, if you think about it, um, try to replace the line, you know, in a, in a jump to Avalanche Alley in, in Jackson Blue, you have to negotiate six T's. And uh, so it'd be a work for, the, I don't know, a couple of hours, three hours, four hours, maybe five hours to, you know, done. And you replaced one section, not that long. So um, that's why you try to stay away and be, you know, as gentle as possible if something like that happened. And the line being covered in marine life, you know, I'm, I'm sure he's talking about a sea case. Yeah, that could be an issue. Uh, the, the marine life also could deteriorate the integrity of the line. So the line can, you know, snap broken. So in those cases, they should probably maintain uh, these lines more closely or watch them more closely than we do in a, in a freshwater case. And just to add to that, I mean, when, when you're actually doing a blackout drill or a blackout exit, you're not grabbing that line. You're just, you know, owing the line. So there's, the line is passing through an O in your finger. Yes. You're not, so, so, I mean, and, and also when you're exiting a cave in a no visibility situation, your hand is the last, or your hand getting cut is the last of your worries. You know, you just want to exit that cave whilst maintaining, you know, buoyancy and having your gas available. Uh, so back your fundamental skills, you know, right. if you can control your buoyancy, you know, you're pulling on the line or you're digging the line in the mud, it could snap and you have a bad day coming. Yeah. Yeah. So you want to have it in your, in the O between your, you know, thumb and uh, index finger and yeah. not snag anywhere. So, yeah. I mean, that's, that's about it so far. Any questions? Let's, do you want to just take and take on any brand new questions? I'm just going to let everybody, okay, five minutes, any questions before we shut down? I, I'm sure Michael has some uh, important stuff to do. Oh. Oh. Okay. Oh. Oh, okay. This is, oh, it was kind of weird. I couldn't see you the whole the time. I'm on one of the 
uh, right now I'm I'm in one wait hang on yeah now do you see me now no uh Sheldon ask any any experience on a crazy extreme dance uh, uh the extreme dives I did uh, uh a, a bigger dives, extreme dives, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, be honest with you, I have a more, uh, more crazy experience on the teaching dives than I did on the <laughs> expedition. <laughs> but a um, 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 couple of times I actually had a real, I mean, real out of gas situation that the student was uh, thinking he's out of air and he attacked me. Uh, so I had that happen twice. Uh, I it wasn't had... me. No, it wasn't you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I had that happen twice, uh, and it was just, uh, it was just, um... and it goes back to the fundamental skills. Um, he had a, a left post roll off, so he was in the side mount uh, uh, gear, and because the tanks were not properly adjusted, and he refused uh, my suggestions. Uh, to adjust it, you know, and his buoyancy control was poor. What happened to him, he rolled off his left post. And when he, when he was doing uh, the gas switch between the long hose on the right post and left post, he clicked the post and he switched it one, took a short breath, and he thought he was out of air. But he was not. It was just shut off. And he, if he were thinking straight, he would just go back to the hose that he just stored and he would when he half tanked, you know, for so yeah, I had happened that twice to me. Uh, once I had a guy that I had to drag out of the cave. Uh, we had a complete buoyancy loss. It was a weird, freaky accident that I never seen before, before and ever after yet. And that was not fun either. Uh, so I suggest to all the cave diving instructors to go and work out because you're gonna need the strength. <laughs> to uh, pull your student out of the cave <laughs> one day. <clears throat> okay, one more question about uh, how many cave di cavers, I'm, I'm guessing that's cave diving, how many cave divers in the USA and worldwide approximately? That is something that I will be able to answer, but uh, if I may, I will just go sidetrack a little bit. Uh, a couple of years ago on the DEMA, uh, the TBI, uh, 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 released approximate calculation comparing the open water advance and rescue, you know, to technical diving. And I think Brian Kearney came up with the number that all the technical divers in the whole world, and I think it was collecting uh, data from SSI, PADI, and SDI, TBI, whole, it's less than 1%. So uh, if I would say uh, not all technical divers are cave divers, but all cave divers are technical divers because you have to do some uh, deco diving. So you consider yourself a technical diver. So I think it's going to be pretty low. Uh, and again, it's like a concentration spots. Uh, Northwest Florida, you're going to see, you know, uh, cave divers a lot more often than you will see them in Colorado, I would say. Or, uh, you know, area where the cave diving is popular, like uh, Bahamas, Mexico, you know, Florida, Mexico. If you throw a stone around a, a spring, you're going to hit a cave diver. Sure. <laughs> uh, like Mexico, you know, Mexico is probably more popular than, than Florida because the easier of travel, you know, less restrictions. Uh, the caves are more prettier, uh, uh, more decorated, you know, easier to dive because they're a little bit shallower, warmer water. I'm not saying it's easy, easier uh, for logistics and planning. Uh, so the, the exact number I do not have. And uh, maybe one of the, some of the agencies will tell, okay, well, we have a certified so-and-so uh, divers per year. They might have the records, but I'm not sure if they will share them with us. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a pretty small number. It It, it would definitely be you know, within the first 10, maybe 15,000, I guess. Uh... I, I think so, you know, it's it's hard to estimate it. And, you know, uh, the other question is if they stay, stay active. Right. The average span, and I've talked to you, I've been this for, you know, 18 years. 
the average lifetime for cave divers between three to five years. After that, they get bored or tired or, you know, life carries on. So they stop being active. So uh, active cave divers, it's really hard to estimate it, you know, a uh, couple thousand, three, four, five thousand, you know. Yeah. I mean, like, like we were talking that day, right? Tiger Woods is cave trained. But not a cave diver. <laughs> yes, a Tiger cave. Woods uh, is, a, is a full cave diver, uh, trained by Bill Reniker uh, at some point. Not the full cave, but some point. I've seen yeah. his photo with Bill A Reniker. lot of people do their cave course or technical course and never again go into the water to dive it. It's less like a card that they've got and which they use for improving their you know, recreational diving. So... That also, like you said, you know, a lot of people who are not active cave or technical divers is is quite is probably a number which uh, would be a different uh, ball game. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Okay, next question. Uh, I'm not going to answer. Take that right now. I'm going to probably take it at the end. Okay. Any thoughts on a dive body team with two different uh, systems, basically back mount and side mount, and how does it affect gas planning? Good question. Yes. Uh, excellent question, actually. Yeah. Uh, uh, and the same for, for open circuit and CCR. Open circuit Combo and CCR D. doesn't matter. Okay. And <clears throat> like I always say, and I actually do that uh, quite uh, often now, but my, my buddies are not CCR yet. I'm the only, well, not only one, I'm the one with diving with them. <laughs> so we always calculate the bailout, you know, for both of us. So, um, the gear configuration I dive, I have to know that you know my maximum point of penetration with the, this gas supply is this and this, and his point of pen maximum penetration based on his gas supplies is this and this, and then we combine the number and see what is safe, what not. So if he has a completely gas loss, a catastrophic gas loss, do I have enough gas to get him half plus supply my unit? you know, to swim out and vice versa. Well, for him, it's a little bit easier. He just need to preserve the dirt pretty much, you know, for me to get me out. <clears throat> so stuff like that. But, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not against, you know, combined teams. Absolutely not. Uh, uh, because that's how people get experience. And that's actually exposed to a different problem keeps you thinking. And once you stop thinking, then you have a problem. So if you keep thinking what could go wrong, how I'm going to fix the problem, that's the way to do it. And that's, that's uh, you know, if you have a diver in one side mouth, one back mouth, I've heard before, okay, well, you have to have a manifold, blah, blah, you know. No, you don't. You just need to be careful of what you're doing and plan accordingly and stick to the plan. I can't wait to go diving with you, Michael, when you're well on the side wonder and I'm an open circuit side mount. Yeah, yeah, anytime. Man. We just do that. Florida's going to be open tomorrow, opening tomorrow, I hope. So now you yeah. can travel to Florida <laughs> without being quarantined for a few weeks. Yeah, I mean, let's see what how that goes. Okay, one more question. Uh, Rupi says, they, they say cave diving has the largest number of fatalities. Why is this the case? Why is this the case of different agencies having standards for cave diving? Would it make it safer? On an average, how much riskier is cave diving compared to, let's say, normal tech diving, if normal tech diving exists? Well, the fatalities, I wouldn't say we have it more than anybody else. It's more popularized because, you know, uh, when the news has nothing to do and the sharks are not, are not eating the baiters or divers, you know, what are you going to write and, and, and brag about? So if there is a fatality in a cave, it's, it's known immediately and it's usually, you know, media circus. But if you really go to the data through Dan, a Divers Alert Network, you know, there are more people dying on the regular, you know, recreational dives uh, than we have fatalities in the overhead environment. If we do, it's usually a fatality because of the environment. And like I said before, you know, you have a very limited time to solve the problem. Even if you calculate for the risk, you know, if you plan for the risk, you know, you only have very limited time. Unless you dive in the closed circuit, then you know we already heard that before. So I I wouldn't uh, uh, respectfully disagree that we have a high you know uh, fatality rate. Uh, it's just more popularized and it's more more out there. Okay, 
So um, remember the big media circus about the Thai boys, you know, being stuck in a cave, which was an amazing operation where, you know, the cave divers, you know, joined them and help. Uh, if that was unsuccessful, you will hear that for another five years, you know, how dangerous it is, you know, and how we should close the caves. It's not the cave, it's the humans, you know, that they're making poor decisions like uh, uh, entering the cave system or the cave, you know, without proper training, proper equipment, uh, proper knowledge, okay? But uh, what was the second part of the question? Whether it is more dangerous than technical diving? Uh, no, I don't think so. And uh, uh, when I, I was kind of anecdotal uh, saying, I said, well, in the cave, it's only one way in, one way out. You can't get lost. Uh, in deco time, you are protected against uh, currents, boats, sharks, uh, jellyfish, you know, all the big animals messing with you in the open ocean or open water, you know. And um, so I don't think so. I think it's equally, equally uh, enjoyable, equally fun. And uh, the deep sea diving, I think it's a little bit more dangerous because you have to deal with the extra stuff that I just said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, what, what, what one of my opinions in this is that, I mean, one of the opinions which I have when people ask me this is that, I mean, the, if you look at technical and cave divers, uh, uh, we actually take more precautions and plan our dives a lot better than most open circuit I mean, uh, or you know uh, open water divers when i say open water i mean your certification could be you know rescue deep instructor but you would still be diving in an open water environment without taking without actually doing in depth plan like uh, you would do for technical or cave diving i mean the amount of time we spend planning the dive is i think about maybe four or five times the actual amount of time we do diving yeah, I agree with you. Uh, exactly. Um, that's a good point. Uh, because, you know, we plan, we check the gear, gear, you know, before every dive, we do the pre-dive safety check, you know, gear check, you know, dive plan. So I agree the complacency from the, uh, we might call them sport diving community, uh, you know, where, um, and that's the, it's not their fault. It's, you know, our fault as instructors, not teaching them better. Uh, that they you know uh say okay well i just put the gear together i'm good to go you know did you did you check it's really full it's supposed to it's the gauge reading the proper you know it's it's the boat second stage is working you know stuff like that and uh me being around uh i, I used to be a full-time uh, open water instructor for five years working for a local dive shop i i've seen that uh the recreational sport divers have a tendency to skip these safety checks, you know, and the safety protocol. And that's, uh, like you said, you know, uh, could be an issue because uh, we as a tech divers, you know, we planning for the risk and checking everything prior to every dive. Okay, one last question, I mean, one question and then after this, the last question. Comments on Discover Cavern Diving? Uh... That is a, I think it's a TDI course now. It's a Discover Kevin Diving. Um, I haven't thought one yet, to be honest with you. Um, it's like a Discover Scuba, right? From uh, the other scuba diving agencies. Uh, it's hard to tell. Uh, um, at some places, I think some places, uh, we, it's probably doable. Like, you know, uh, you've been to Vortex several times with me and you know that the cavern zone, it's uh, it's so huge and so silkless that, you know, it, it might be uh, safe to take people there. But to be honest with you, the uh, Discover Cavern, I haven't seen the standards yet and um, never been asked yet from anybody to teach it. So uh, I, you know, my personal opinion, it's non-existent at this moment because I just don't know. Uh, There's a lot of DSTs happening in cenotes in Mexico. Uh, Discover school. Which, uh, which I mean, if, if you look at it, it's probably, a, you know, discover cavern diving, but not because in cavern, like Anshuman was joking about, for cavern, you would probably need a shovel for discover cavern diving <laughs> as a required <laughs> piece of equipment. But yeah. I mean, the idea about cavern, even discover cavern is to understand how the cavern system is, how a reel is, how to use stuff like that. So that itself wouldn't be a discover course, really. I mean, it could be one part of the discover, you know, 
I I mean like I haven't read the uh, standards as yet. Uh, I just did my TDI crossover, by the way. So uh, that's done. Congratulations. <laughs> so thank you. So I'm just uh, uh, now you joined the real instructors. <laughs> real instructors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, last question. Anybody? Uh, otherwise, we have a fun question. <laughs> which i will answer later on uh, of of this uh, uh, last question anybody we've been on for about an hour and 7 minutes now okay if there are no more questions i am going to thank michael for his time and thank you all for joining us uh it's been great to have another hour of uh, you know talking about diving and technical diving and cave diving especially something which i i love and i'm sure all of you who are here are at least uh, you know thinking about it for those of you all who are not yet uh, cave and technical divers and thank you so much michael for your thank you. uh, time thanks for having me you know it was a pleasure always uh, and good to see you uh, you know after good about to see you too. a month <laughs> uh, i'm waiting for you to show up uh, so we can go diving together yes all right All right thank well you. thank you guys for listening and be safe you too